Ultimately, when I go back and look at the different Royal Rumbles, one of my least favorite is the 2007 Royal Rumble. And that's not just necessarily due to, let's say, match quality. I wouldn't go that far. It's definitely not the worst in terms of overall match quality, even though it was not a great, great show for that, I don't think. The biggest thing that this Royal Rumble to me ultimately represents is disappointment and what could have been and tragedy in some ways. And I'll get to that here in a moment. Now, the show kicked off with another good, really opening tag match um, that you tended to get more over the years out of the Royal Rumble. Opening matches on pay-per-views, because you only have five or six matches most years, gets more time. It tends to be a tag match. I've always been a fan of tag team wrestling in the Hardys, and Eminem went out there and had a really good tag team match. It really did. You know, it's a good table setter, a good curtain jerker, if you will. One disappointment about this, though, is when you go back and look and you say, man, nobody involved with this match is with the company anymore. And that was just back in 2007. You know, Jeff Hardy's been toiling away in TNA the past few years. Uh, and John Morrison. It's like, you look at him at one point in time, you thought they were going to put the rocket ship up his ass and take him all the way to the top, and it just never happened. I mean, there were insane shaman of sexy fans that were trying to compare this jabroni to Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels, he is not. But in this era, did he have the chance to become a big star? Yes. And when you go back and look at it, it's very disappointing to see what could have been and then ultimately what the result was. Again, kind of a theme to me when I go back throughout watching this 2007 Royal Rumble. The second match, the ECW World Title match. Bobby Lashley defeating Test by Countout. Just an awkward, really odd match. But again, you go back and look at this seven years ago. Now both of these guys are no longer with the company, and one of these guys is no longer even with us, period. How sad is that? That Andrew Test Martin is dead, and he's been gone for a few years now. You know, it just shows you you got to be careful with steroids and other illicit drugs, if you will. It's just really sad when you go back and watch, and you're like, man, this is only seven years ago. He was a young dude, and he's gone. It's sad. Also sad for different reasons is Bobby Lashley. I mean, this was a guy that you thought... The WWE had dollar signs in their minds and in their eyes, and they were going to try everything they could to make him a big monster star, especially that big monster black star that this company has needed for so many years. And it just never really materialized. I mean, it's like Bobby Lashley's big highlight to me is working with Umaga at WrestleMania 23 because he was involved in the McMahon-Trump storyline, and then it's, oh. I realize he technically did other stuff, but like I said, you go back and look on this now seven years ago, you would have thought things would have turned out much differently with Bobby Lashley than they ended up actually doing. And we look at the third match, the World Heavyweight Championship match, a feud that I really liked, Batista and Mr. Kennedy, and a character that I really, really liked, I was a huge fan of, and that's Mr. Kennedy. I thought going into 2007, this feud with Batista, feuding with The Undertaker, I thought Mr. Kennedy was going to have a monster year. Here he is at the Royal Rumble, one of your signature events, your second most bought pay-per-view of the year. He's wrestling for the World Heavyweight Championship against a legit top guy in Batista for the World Heavyweight Championship. I thought he was going to have a monster 2007. He was going to go on to have a signature WrestleMania moment, which he kind of frankly did. And then at some point in time, he was going to become a world champion, maybe a good one for the WWE, in particular on the SmackDown brand. And then, of course, that just kind of never materialized. Mr. Kennedy did have that big moment, winning the Money in the Bank briefcase at WrestleMania 23. And later on, he gets injured at a house show, even though the injury wasn't as severe as initially reported. Um, and then he ends up having to drop the briefcase to Edge for whatever damn reason, so that way they could have Edge cash in on Taker. And you could sit there and say, yeah, eventually Edge and Taker had a phenomenal feud, and they did, down the road. But it's just very disappointing when you go back and look at what Mr. Kennedy was being positioned to do, what he was getting ready to do, and then ultimately what he did. And it's especially sad when I kick on TNA every week and I see what has become of Ken Kennedy in Mr. Anderson. Just sad. Really sad. Ken Anderson, whatever the hell. Mr. Anderson, very sad. Very tragic to me. 
Then we get to the WWE Championship match, a last man standing match between John Cena and Umaga. And again here, you're talking about Umaga, who's been gone for several years now. This is back in 2007. Two participants in your world title matches on this card are dead and have been dead for a few years. How sad and tragic that really is. And also how sad and tragic it is, going back on the career of Umaga, that it seemed like the WWE thought they had something, thought they had a big monster, but were never really willing to go all the way with him. He was just going to be used as a dance partner, and then down the road they were just going to showcase him, but not really showcase him for any particular reason, and they didn't know where to go with him. And you see that here. Now, this was a pretty good last man standing match, but you knew, I think, all along going into it that John Cena was going to win, and... That's just how things were going to work out. Not much more to talk about, but again, think about that, though. In 2007, Umaga was wrestling for the WWE Championship. Test was wrestling for the ECW Championship. They are now both dead. And then we get to the one real highlight that I have from this show. The one real thing that I really like, even though this wasn't the cleanest and best Rumble match by any stretch of the imagination. I'm always an advocate of, when it makes sense, pushing the younger guys and helping to create new stars. You know, I'm very big even in the sports world. I focus on baseball. I focus on the prospects in the minor leagues. In the NFL, I'm always focused on the NFL draft, doing mock drafts, rating prospects, doing a big board, all this other stuff. So I'm always into the future, the future sometimes to the detriment of the present. So I'm all for, you know, building those new stars, building that next generation, and having those young guys go over whenever it makes sense. And in this case, you had Randy Orton and Edge uh, last until the Final Four. But one thing I will not knock here is I feel like the WWE made the right decision in terms of the other two members in that Final Four, Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, and getting rid of Randy Orton and Edge so that way we could get to the last two of Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. How awesome this was. How much of a markout moment this was for me. Especially because when you think about it, back in 2007, Taker had been with the company since late 1990 and had never won the Royal Rumble. How sad would that have been if Taker would have went through his entire career without winning the Royal Rumble one time? Well, for a huge Taker mark like me, this is a glorious match because this is the one time Taker actually did win the Royal Rumble. And he was going to be an even bigger deal heading into WrestleMania than he was most years because of the streak. Great finish. You know, one of my favorite Rumble matches because of the finish and because of who won. No apologies here for that. One thing, again, though, that I look back on it and I say, man, they missed an opportunity and man, it's disappointing. You know, they had Undertaker waffle a little bit before he ultimately chose to go after Batista in the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 23. And they had a good program, a really good feud, a good rivalry, and had a really good match at WrestleMania 23 that year. No question about it. But they just had to send Shawn Michaels at John Cena. Traditionally, you saw this over the years where uh, the winner would get a title shot and then the second place guy would get the other title holder and get a shot at him at Mania, and that's what played out here. But you look at it now in 2014, one of those monster matches, one of those big-time matches that most of us as fans realize that the clock is ticking, but we deep down all want to see this at some point in time before it's too late, and that's John Cena versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Well, here was a chance in 2007 where John Cena was the WWE champion. Undertaker was your Royal Rumble winner, but was it because you wanted to keep Taker on SmackDown? Was it because you were afraid of hurting any momentum Cena had by having him have to do the job to Taker at Mania 23 in the main event? You know, I just think about that. You know, John Cena and Shawn Michaels had an all fine and good main event at WrestleMania 23, but did anybody really envision Shawn Michaels actually beating John Cena? You know, it was the second straight year where John Cena went into a WrestleMania the champion and left the champion. He beat Triple H the year before, made him tap out, and then he beat Shawn Michaels here at WrestleMania 23. It's like, Shawn Michaels versus Batista could have had a really good program and feud over the World Heavyweight Championship. I would have rather have seen Undertaker and John Cena 
have a feud and have a program heading into WrestleMania 23. Even though Taker and Batista had a really good piece of business, a really good rivalry, and they had a pretty good match at Mania 23, it was still, what, like third or fourth on the card? It came a couple matches before the damn Vince and Donald Trump battle of the billionaires. I guarantee you WrestleMania 23, if you have Undertaker versus John Cena, that one's main eventing. You know, it's, it's always disappointing to me that it's now 2014, and we still haven't found a way to give us Undertaker versus John Cena at WrestleMania. A match, I believe, should happen and needs to happen and should have already happened by now. But with the other things factored in and looking back at, like, Test and Umaga and the fact that they're no longer with us, what happened with Mr. Kennedy, what happened with John Morrison, this is just a very disappointing show that leaves a bad taste in my mouth, other than the fact that one of my all-time favorites, Taker, won the Royal Rumble. That was the saving grace of this show, but a lot of other disappointment other than that.